Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger, and welcome to this investigation of the sociology of pure mathematics. Today I want to introduce a very important uh, topic which sits at uh, the heart of a lot of the problematic aspect, the challenges that face pure mathematics, and a source of a lot of the contention within the community. It's a foundational issue having to do with our number system, our underlying number system. And I claim that modern pure mathematics actually relies on a fake arithmetic. And I want to explain this. So even if you're a sociologist and maybe not too mathematically inclined, I'm going to try to frame the discussion so you know broadly at least what the issues are and some of the you know, features of it so that you can you know, investigate the sociological aspects. Okay, so it all has to do with a number system which we call the real numbers. It's always denoted by this sort of solid looking R here, which I claim is actually a fake arithmetic. And unfortunately, this fake arithmetic and its sort of cousin, sort of a super souped up version of it, the complex numbers, these two number systems underlie a lot of modern mathematics including modern peer analysis, topology, differential geometry, and algebraic geometry. Now between these, this is roughly speaking at least half of modern peer mathematics. So this is an issue that really covers a lot of territory. And I claim that it's really a case of the mathematical emperor having no clothes. That particular fairy tale, I remember when I was young, I was disbelieving of it. It seemed to me too fantastical to be, you know, possible. How can all these people see this emperor with no clothes and pretend that it's not so? But as I've gotten older, I've appreciated the importance of this fairy tale. It really cuts to some fundamental aspect of human beings, that we want to align our beliefs with those around us. And that's such a powerful force. Of course, something very important from a sociological perspective. Arithmetic in mathematics really rests on three components. First of all, a number system. Then, arithmetical operations. And then, laws of arithmetic within that system. So let me explain the standard frameworks that we have in mathematics. We don't actually just have one number system. Okay? We have several different kinds of number systems that have been developed in different contexts and that have relatively different advantages. The simplest and probably the most familiar are the natural numbers, where we just stick with numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, like the counting numbers. And uh, then we can extend that by including negative numbers also, and those are called the integers. Okay. And then a little bit more sophisticated, fractions or rational numbers. Things like 13 over 7 or minus 2 over 5. That supports division as well. Then there's a, a, a variant on this called decimal numbers which, strictly speaking, are kind of contained in here, but they really have a quite a different form. Uh, something like 4.23 or minus 17.6. So these various number systems have historically been around for a long time. And if we go back to the very early days of modern civilization in the Middle East uh, with the ancient Egyptians and the Sumerians and the Babylonians, the fraction system was dominant in the Egyptian story they used fractions, while the Babylonians had a base 60 version of decimal numbers. So these go back a long time, and, um, and there's lots of interesting aspects of them. Okay, so we have these basic numbers, and then we have operations, arithmetical operations with them. Things like addition, prominently, 5 plus 3 is 8. Like multiplication, minus 2 times 6 is minus 12. We can do that kind of operation also with fractions. For example, one half plus one third is five sixths. We can do arithmetic with decimals. 4.1 plus 3.7 is 7.8. Division, usually the most problematic operation. Say in the natural numbers, there's a limited kind of division, like 24 divided by six is four. 
but uh, in general, if you want to do division sort of uniformly, you have to move to the fractions or rational numbers. So for example, one half divided by one fifth equals five halves. So we have these various number systems. There are these sort of standard arithmetical operations. And then there are the laws of arithmetic. These are the properties that these operations satisfy. For example, the commutative law, that 3 plus 5 is the same as 5 plus 3. Or the associative law, say in multiplication, 1 half times 1 third times 5 sevenths is the same as 1 half times 1 third times 5 sevenths. And distributive law, in this case illustrated for decimal numbers, that if you have 1.2 times 3.4 plus 6.8, that's the same as 1.2 times 3.4 plus 1.2 times 6.8. Now these laws of arithmetic have to ultimately be proven. Right? That's part of the, the story, that you have to establish these laws of arithmetic. Hopefully you have a solid foundation of what the actual objects are. You have very precise definitions of the operations and then you can aspire to proving the laws of arithmetic. That's a very attractive uh, kind of framework that mathematicians are very interested in, of course. So which of these systems do scientists, engineers, computer programmers generally use? Surprisingly, the answer is none of the above. In practical applications, a variant of our existing formal number systems are used. And this variant is more suited for actual practical applications, even if theoretically it's not as clean. Okay, And we can best describe it with, say, the decimal floating point system. So I'm going to give you the computer version of this, uh, which is similar but not exactly the same as what scientists or engineers might do. So, in a computer, you want to represent numbers, but crucially, typically you have only a rigid, finite amount of space. At least traditionally, this is the way it was. Okay? So a uh, standard agreement was to represent numbers with uh, this form, that there's a mantissa, say 5.6123917. Okay, that's a decimal number. And then um, a multiplication by a power of 10, involving an exponent, say 10 to the 3. And then this means, that's the number you get by multiplying by 10 to the 3 is basically moving the decimal point over three places. So this is really effectively the number 5612.3917. Now the key thing here is that we are agreeing that all our numbers are representable in the same finite amount of space. That makes actually the the definition of the arithmetical operations and calculations uh, a little bit more subtle because typically when you add or you multiply or you divide you end up getting bigger numbers than the ones that you started with. So even though the numbers you may have started with are all fitting into this rather narrow confines, the numbers that you may get out of the result of calculations exceeds that. So what's necessary is to uh, augment this arithmetic with truncations or round off. Okay? So the scientists, the computer programmers, the engineers are quite happy to work with round off and truncation. They've figured out ways of doing this. But it is important to appreciate that the arithmetical operations are technically really only approximate here. And there's often uh, errors floating around and that part of the challenge in working with such an arithmetic is to sort of keep track of the errors and, and make sure that they don't get uh, too, too big to interfere with what we're trying to do. Now a scientist or an engineer might not go this whole way. They might just say, oh look, we're just interested in some quantity and we want to uh, say it up to two or three decimal places. That might be enough. So an engineer might say, okay, this thing here should measure 5.612. That's pretty accurate. Okay. Uh, and they might be actually flexible about the number of digits that are required for a particular kind of application. So this is not really just one exact system, it's a kind of an approach which is flexible, which incorporates errors, which incorporates truncations and round off. So it is actually quite different from the sort of formal rigid systems that pure mathematicians have developed that I just explained to you on the previous slide. But what about pure mathematicians? 
what number system do they generally use? Well, the answer is none of the above. They have, or we have, our own particular number system, which is based on the real numbers, okay? And this is um, an extension, a, a broadening, a, a much more complicated number system, which includes, sort of inside it, the natural numbers and the integers and the fractions and the decimal numbers, but extends these things by allowing essentially infinite decimals. Okay, that's the key point. But this number system, which is the one that I'm claiming is really a fake arithmetic, has uh, a lot of problematic aspects exactly because of this need to incorporate these infinite aspects. Okay, so what is a real number? Well, that's a very subtle, delicate question. Okay. Historically, real numbers sort of arose, you know, sort of implicitly in the 17th and 18th centuries, but more precisely, somewhat more precisely in the 19th century, where at first people thought in terms of infinite decimals. So this goes back to Simon Stevin, um, who realized that fractions could be exchanged for decimals that had an infinite but repeating aspect. And then eventually people figured out that there were other kinds of quantities like pi and e and so on that involved also decimals that kept on going but didn't have a repeating aspect. And so these were kind of these new um, real numbers that they had to try to uh, extend the arithmetic for. And in the 19th century it became clear that actually, even though this is how we think about what a real number is, actually theoretically working with this framework is problematic for reasons I'm going to explain to you shortly. So other approaches to what a real number really is were, were proposed. Dedekind proposed that um, a real number could be thought of as a Dedekind cut, which, okay, roughly is, let's say here's the number line, okay? So imagine like numbers, so zero, one, two, three, etc. So suppose that we have some, some ostensible real number, which is sort of supposedly somewhere right there, representing a point on our number line. Okay. So the way Dedekind said, okay, this number, this new real number that we're trying to invoke, its existence, it may not be a rational number, but it separates the existing numbers into the ones which are left of it and the ones which are right. So if we just look at rational numbers, there's all the rational numbers to the left of this new one and all the numbers to the right. Okay? And that separation of the rational numbers into these two sets, Dedekind realized this was some kind of replacement for the real number itself. In other words, you could actually try to define the real number, not in terms of some infinite decimal like this, but in terms of, well, these two collections of rational numbers necessarily each involving an infinite number of things, including ones with super huge numerators and denominators. So that's a, a Dedekind cut approach to real numbers. So it's just a variant, just another way of thinking about an infinite decimal. And then another approach which was uh, advantageous for sort of certain analysis kinds of things was to think of it as a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers. Okay, actually, to be more precise, an equivalence class of Cauchy sequence of the rational. So it makes it quite complicated. But so it's something like this. So it's, it's a big set, okay? And here is supposedly a Cauchy sequence. Here's another Cauchy sequence. What's a Cauchy sequence? Well, it's a sequence of rational numbers. Okay, the first rational number, second rational number, third number. And, but it's infinite sequence. And here's another one. And here's another one. And supposedly these, these sequences have particular properties. So they're, they're in some sense, they, the, the numbers in the sequence start at some point to, to sort of get closer and closer to each other. And also there's some kind of compatibility that we assume between, uh, between you know, any two of these uh, Cauchy sequences in this big list. Okay. So it's a rather technical thing, but suffice it to say that you know, actually exhibiting such a thing is, is highly problematic. Um, but it's a kind of a theoretical framework that uh, people have tried to invoke in order to try to uh, make it more manageable to deal with the theory of these real numbers. Now I've gone and described these things at great length in my Math Foundation series, so I 
made videos where I show why none of these things really work, okay? Um, but it is quite technical and involves some sophisticated kind of mathematical analysis, okay? But in my opinion, none of these things uh, really uh, work, and that becomes clearer when we look at the arithmetic of real numbers. So it's very important to get some idea of why this ostensible arithmetic with real numbers is actually fake. Okay. So let me try to express the problem by having a look at some two real numbers in decimal form and the question of how do we add these two things. Okay, so here is some infinite decimal whose name is alpha and here are you know, the first uh, 10 or 20 or 30 uh, digits of it. But you should think about this as just being the first part of something that goes on forever, whatever that means. And here's a second one, its name is beta. And suppose we want to add these two things. Well, that's not so easy because usually if we have finite decimals, we would start the addition process by starting on the right. And we would add 9 plus 5 is 14, we'd write the 4 and we'd carry the 1. And then you know, we'd carry on from right to left, carrying as we go. Unfortunately, in this case, there's no right point, so there's no sort of end point because the things go on forever. So what we can do is we can kind of, you know, do a, a partial thing and then go further and do it again and perhaps modify some of the things that we've already done. So let me just illustrate that with the, the first part here. So if we started sort of on the left and added 51 plus 108, we'd get 159. Okay, so we can write down 159. And now we sort of move over. Okay, now we have 4 plus 7. Well, that's 11. So we have to write down the 1, and then we have to carry a 1. But there was a 9 here. So that 1 that we're carrying makes that 9 into a 0, and then bumps another 1 to the next column, making the 5 into a 6. So we started writing 159, and now we realize we have to rub that off and write 160.1. And we're still not entirely sure about the the one because what's happening after that might influence this. And that's especially going to happen when we have numbers that add up to nine. So if we have a lot of totals which are nine, then we're not sure if there's going to be a wave of carries that's going to sweep through that entire sequence until we sort of get to the first thing which is not a nine. And we see that it's either less than nine or, or bigger than nine. Okay, So this problem of carries um, is always present, and especially with infinite uh, sequences, we expect that there will be lots of places where there's strings of nines, and so this kind of compl complexity is, is quite challenging. So we could encompass the, the situation in the following statement, that actually there's no algorithm. There's no precise algorithm for specifying the sum of these two things. In the following way, suppose that like, this is obviously an inadequate representation of the real number because I'm not telling you all these infinite digits. Suppose that instead of having a string like this with three dots, we actually had a computer program, okay? Like an app on your mobile phone or something. And you input a number, like the position of the decimal, maybe the, the you know, input number nine, and you would output one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You would output the ninth decimal. So if you input 9, you get a 2. You input 10, you get a 7. You input 11, you get 2, etc. Okay, that program then will capture this first real number alpha, and then you suppose you have a second program called beta. And now your challenge is to construct a third program which represents the sum of these two things. So you want to program uh, an app that will input natural number n and output the nth digit of the sum of these two things. And that turns out to be impossible. So you just can't do that. The infinite aspect of these decimals prevents you from doing that. You can talk about the infinite sum, you know, as if it works, but you can't actually specify an algorithm to take this algorithm and this algorithm and combine them to get an algorithm for the sum. What does that mean? Well, it means that this is fake, okay, that we don't actually have a legitimate arithmetical operation of addition here. So, in fact, the objects themselves are not properly defined, the operations are not properly defined, and the laws of arithmetic are, in fact, not proven. 
that's the reality for the real number system. And that is um, just a, a key feature of the modern educational world. That whenever it comes to the arithmetic of real numbers, uh, students are, you know, a lot of subject to a lot of hand waving. Uh, there's a lot of references to references over the hill that we're not going to deal with in this course because it's too complicated. Or there's some little appendix at the end of the, the book that sort of summarily gives some usually inadequate treatment of these issues. But in particular, the laws of arithmetic are almost never proven. So it is really a fake system of arithmetic which underpins modern pure mathematics. One of the uh, disconcerting aspects of the complexity of the real numbers is that we have to employ a whole machinery of symbolics to try to represent the output of operations that we can't do. So if you're dealing with fractions, you know, the standard form of a fraction is always integer divided by integer. And you can recognize very quickly whether, you know, what you've got on the pages is a valid fraction or not. But not so with real numbers. So in, in the real number world, you're allowed to do these infinite operations, as we've seen, you know, that every, the infinite aspect is interwoven in the objects and in the operations and in the laws of arithmetic. So in many situations, we have these infinite operations, which we can't actually, you know, evaluate, but we want to talk about the outputs as if they could be evaluated. So we have to invoke a whole bunch of symbolics such as square root of 2. There's a classical algorithm for computing a square root, but it doesn't finish. But we write down the symbol pretending that we've run this algorithm to the end and achieved an output. There is pi, there is e, there is log 10, there is the cube root of 301, sine of 17, tan of minus 1 over 51, arc cosine of 0.7, gamma, that's some other special real number. Zeta of 13, gamma, this is another special function, gamma of 22 over 17, e of 7 over 6. So if you're a student of mathematics, you have to ultimately learn all of these things. You have to know, I know what cosine is, I know what arc cosine is, I can say what log. There's, there's theories behind all of these symbols. But actually the story is, is much more extensive. There's a vast array of other special functions and other things that are invoked that have their own special names. In fact, it's kind of omnipresent. It's easy just to cook up new things. Like, suppose you take a sum, which is one of the analyst's favorite things. So take an infinite sum. Take an infinite sum. Sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n cubed plus n factorial. It's the kind of thing that analysts like to, to talk about. That, that they, they imagine that they are able to add up all of these things. So it means you have to replace the n with a 1. We get 1 over 1 plus 1 factorial is 1 half. And then you add that and you put it in equals 2 and you, you, you have these infinite number of things and you have to add them all up together. Even though, you know, once the, the number gets into the, uh, you know, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 uh, range, uh, these things here are impossible to write down because they're way too big to fit into the universe. But nevertheless, we, we have this idea that we can possibly deal with these things, and then we pretending that we can add up all of these things, even though the vast majority of them are so big that they don't fit into our universe, okay? But still, the modern mathematician will believe that this thing here actually represents a real number, because there's these various tricks for, you know, so-called convergence of series. So they believe that this represents some real number. Um, it's just that you can't calculate the real number. So what is its name? Well, this ends up being its name, right? So they, they say this is the real number, that's its name. You get another whole range of things by taking integrals, so the integral from 3 to 7 of some complicated expression involving x. Typically, you can't integrate or simplify that. So that's a, a real number which, which evaluates to itself. Okay, so we have this plethora of all these different symbolics around and uh, this vast yoga of... of trying to manipulate these things and, and do arithmetic with them. But it doesn't really work. Now, if you're a sociologist investigating this, let's say you, you want to take this claim, and you want to uh, see whether this is actually true, whether, you, whether the community actually has an answer to these criticisms. Okay? One of the things that you're going to be exposed to is that whenever you ask a question like this, you're going to get a flood of jargon and convoluted high-level language. Okay? So, 
one way of avoiding that is to stick with questions which are really cut and dried and computationally based so that there's very little wriggle room to uh, try to slip out of the of, of the challenge at hand okay and that's what I want to focus on now I want to give some explicit computing challenges for analysts that will re reveal the truth of my claim that this is really ultimately a fake arithmetic and that does not allow sort of philosophical obfuscation. So this is my favorite one that frequent viewers will be very familiar with. I like to ask what is pi plus e plus square root of 2? These are arguably the three simplest or more familiar irrational numbers. These are real numbers which are not actually rational numbers and it's quite a legitimate question to ask what is the sum of these three things? Without jargon, without a lot of philosophical discussion, just what is the actual answer? You could ask the same question with respect to multiplication, which is naturally a little bit more complicated. What is pi times e times square root of 2? Division even more complicated. Pi divided by e divided by square root of 2. And in the real number world, you're allowed to supposedly take exponentials of real numbers. It's one of the pleasant belief systems. Okay, so what is pi to the e to the square root of 2? Are we allowed to ask that question? Of course we are. Are we allowed to ask for an explicit answer? Well, of course we are. For example, if I asked you what is 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fifth, you're a primary school student, you should be able to answer that. If I ask you what is 2 to the 3 to the 4, you should be able to compute what that is. And if you can't, well, either your understanding is not correct or maybe the framework that we're talking about is a fake framework. If you're sick of pi and e and root 2, here's some alternatives that illustrate the point as well. What is cosine 7 plus tan of 2? These are amongst the many symbolics that we have. So what happens if you add this thing to that? What do you actually get? If you multiply log 3 times sine of 4, what do you actually get? If you look at this infinite sum, n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n factorial plus 1, what do you actually get? You get a real number. So which real number do you get? How about cos squared 5 plus sine squared 5? Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait. Hold your horses. Stop the presses. I think I can do that one. Cos squared 5 plus sine squared 5. Ah. Hallelujah. There is some abstract theory that allows us to calculate this without actually calculating it. We know that the answer is 1. Isn't that great? In fact, we've been able to do it without actually obtaining cosine of 5. That would be an infinite amount of work. Without having to square it, without having to calculate sine of 5 and squaring that and then adding these two things together. That would be a lot of infinite amount of work. No, but we have this identity and that really makes us feel good because now we can say, aha, you see, we can do real number arithmetic. And that's true. So in certain cases, we can cook up something. Here's another example like that. Instead of a complicated sum like this, this is a lot simpler. Summation n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. It's like 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared, etc. Well, Euler famously gave a formula for this. And what was his formula? It was pi squared over 6. And most analysts say, well, that's an answer. But if you're a primary school student, you are allowed to say, but wait a minute, what is pi squared over 6? You know, instead of being pi squared over 6, if it was 12 squared over 6, your teacher would not allow you to keep it in that form. She would expect you to reduce it. So 12 squared over 6 is uh, 24. So you, she'd want to see the 24, not the 12 squared over 6. So aren't we allowed to also just move the question mark over and ask, yeah, okay, but what is pi squared over 6? That's actually a very interesting question. And what about 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fifth? Well, ostensibly, rational numbers are inside real numbers. So you could calculate this if you've done some primary school addition. But maybe 
if you're working in the real numbers, you could do the same thing as my analyst friends are likely to do with this. If I ask my analyst friend to simplify this, almost surely they're going to, after some waffling, they're going to say the answer is pi plus e plus square root of 2. That's just as simple as it gets. Okay. So, is this a valid answer? If we're going to accept that pi plus e plus square root of 2 evaluates to pi plus e plus square root of 2, why is it not the case that 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fifth evaluates to 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fifth? So that we can circumvent any required understanding of common denominators and doing arithmetic with fractions. So it certainly uh, suggests the possibility that if you're working with real numbers, and you're in a, sort of an undergraduate or a high school student, you know, you have a lot more flexibility about answers because you can just sort of repeat questions to get answers. So anyway, apart from these last ones here, these ones up here are legitimate questions, okay? So I really want answers to these. I, I think it's fair to ask, these are specific challenges involving very simple irrational numbers and the basic operations, and if we do have an arithmetic which is not fake, then we should be able to make these calculations. And if we can't make the calculations, and that's true across the board, then my claim that this is a fake arithmetic uh, really has some merit. So if you look on a modern computer system, you will find that there's no capability of doing real number uh, arithmetic. So a computer is not able to answer the questions that I've asked, except to treat everything in terms of approximate values. And that's perfectly reasonable and fine if you're doing applied mathematics. So a lot of these concepts that I've been talking about are fine and important concepts in applied mathematics. And I have no qualm whatsoever with their usage there. What I have a qualm with is in pure mathematics where we're ostensibly creating a precise solid foundation for the, the whole discipline that these approximate things are being paraded as exact things. So why is this facade being maintained? If there's an obvious disconnect with what our computers can do, and it's obvious that pure mathematicians can't answer the challenges that I've presented, and it's not a, a surprise. Well, the reason is, a very sort of large-scale reason, is that it's to support the theoretical convenience of being able to do an infinite number of tasks. In pure mathematics, there are many situations where we can see that if we were able to do an infinite number of things, then we would arrive at something which is sort of potentially useful to us. Now, we may not be able to actually do an infinite number of things, but we would like to talk about it as if we are able to, because then we can theoretically use the output of that theoretical infinite task as an object in, in our further theories. So as long as we're not obliged to connect with computational reality, we can carry on this sort of thought experiment game where we are taking these infinite numbers of infinite things and, and, and combining them with other infinite things to get further infinite things. Okay. Let me give you two very important examples from classical calculus. Okay? One having to do with the differential calculus, one having to do with the integral calculus. In the differential calculus, a main objective is to try to understand tangents to curves. Okay, that's a tangent. And in particular, an important question is, what is its slope? And the slope is the change in y to the change in x. So there's another point. Uh, there's a little right triangle there. There's a change in, in y. There's a change in x. And the ratio between these is called the slope. And we'd like to figure out what that is. And the standard way of doing that is to take a point on the curve and to deal with the line between that point and the point that we're interested in. And we calculate that slope, which is not going to be the same as this slope, but it's going to be reasonably close, especially if this point is close. And then what we do is we repeat the calculation. So we do it once for that point, and then we move this point down to a closer point and we do it again we get another value, and then, so maybe down there, and then we do it again, we move to a, another point and do it down there, and we, we have this then sequence as we are moving closer and closer to our base point. So we generate a sequence of slopes, and then we would like to say that the slope of the tangent is the 
the infinite limit, the, the thing at the end of the rainbow of this thing. So we actually need to do an infinite number of, of tasks. If you just stop at any sort of finite point, then you only have an approximation, you don't have the exact value. Okay, so that's a very good example of how we want, or how classical analysts want to use an infinite number of tasks to accomplish or to find something that interests them. Another example is calculating an area under a curve. So here's a curve, maybe we're interested in that area, okay, between this x value and that x value. So the classical thing to do is to, to put in lots of little rectangles, you divide this up into little pieces, maybe call it delta x, delta x, delta x, and then you put some rectangles underneath the curve, and you calculate all their areas, and then you get a total area of the rectangles. Well, that's not exactly the same as the area under the curve, so what we have to do is then we have to repeat the process by making the change in x smaller. So we replace the calculation with another calculation involving a smaller change in x. And then we keep on doing this. So again, we have to do it over and over and over and over again, and take that sequence, and take an infinite limit of that sequence. So again, it's very important to be able to approach areas to be able to do this infinite number of tasks if you're a classical analyst. Now, it turns out that with the algebraic calculus, which you can join and you can see, we are able to solve these problems without this infinite assumption, without having to take limits of infinite processes. Okay, but it does require some some new insights. Okay, but so it's not as if I'm proposing to just you know remove calculus from the from the discipline. No, I want to replace the existing calculus with a new and better calculus, which does not rely on this assumption, this unwarranted assumption of being able to do an infinite number of tasks. And then that removes the need for having this fake arithmetic underlying everything, which gives us supposedly objects which our infinite tasks can arrive at. Okay, so this is all very... Um, non-standard, okay, you're not going to find a lot of other mathematicians telling you this, even though, you know, I'm happy to argue with anybody about this. If you're a professional mathematician and you can meet any of my challenges explicitly, okay, please do so. In the comments, links, put something in so we can see the answers to the questions that I've posed. So, I'm hoping that you sociologists are maybe um, intrigued by this. You're saying, yes, there is some potential for widespread discussion here in period mathematics. It's not as if there's all these people on the same page. We have at least a differing of opinion. Okay? And we can start asking, well, how do the sociological forces at play move this entire discussion around? In fact, this discussion is not a new one. This has been going on from the beginnings of the calculus. It's, been, it's a discussion that's been going on in some form or another for four or five hundred years. Okay? It's not something really new. Alright, so there's interesting questions of how this entire framework gets to be maintained. These are sociological issues. They really do need to be investigated. Okay? There's a lot of important work to be done to find out how we've gotten into this situation in the first place and be able to move forward on it. I'm Norman Wobbler. Thanks for listening.